bring uh, so yeah so, uh hi everybody i'd love to introduce terry and Nisha meyer from uh, oxford and i guess the quick summary is that you try to model waves with uh differential equations and machine learning and whatever else it takes yeah welcome yes indeed should i start yeah please Right. Well, thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be here. And I um, guess I'm talking to people scattered around the planet. And that's probably Absolutely. a good introduction to what I want to talk about. It's really sort of multi-scale problems in, in uh, gathering information from around the planet. So um, I'm going to try to cover a lot of ground. I hope this is fine. And I'm not quite sure about the backgrounds, but um, um, let me start with a very broad picture. And that is the essential um, realization that waves um, as a physical process, essentially sort of the most informative um, um, system that, that um, propagates yeah, information, data across many, many scales and distances. And here you just see one rendition of uh, sort of a seismic wave field propagating inside the interior of the Earth. Um, but of course, we observe waves as on this picture, which was taken in Kenya, also from the sun that you see in the background from sort of uh, atmospheric uh, disturbances, of course, like wind. and they're all around us. Essentially, acoustic, um, uh, elastic, or electromagnetic waves are sort of the the end and be all of how we communicate and how we um, how we sort of gather data. Why is that? Well, we're sort of a little bit biased in terms of how we perceive information. And I just wanted to bring up this slide in terms of our own senses. But I think I think there's a um, substantial point to be made why waves are actually fundamentally very very informative. But let me start with the sort of uh, basic grasp on, on what we um, gather as, as human beings. So here are the different senses, um, as we should all be used to. And um, of course, we can sort of subdivide them into just a few different physical categories. One is um, the electromagnetic waves, such as in the air and the wake, vacuum and water, um, acoustic waves, air and water, and, and then um, taste, which I guess could be seen as some sort of chemical dissolution and direct touch. So the problem with information transfer of that, of that kind is, is that it's not long range interaction. So that's not really a very useful way of communicating any type of information. The another one is diffusion, uh, sort of um, yeah, chemical diffusion in the air, um, smell, for example. So, so that is, is also something that, that propagates information to some extent, but not really um, to a large degree or a large, large distance. So I think it, it really leaves us with these sort of wave types. And here I'm adding um, hand as touch for vibrational measurements of mechanical waves as the sort of core um, um, process system with which we, we gather information about our surroundings and, and from each other. Why is that so? Well, they, they tend to um, range over incredibly large distances as an oscillatory system. And um, while um, propagating really far, also um, sort of incorporate and absorb multi-scale interactions with the medium that it propagates through. So that leads us to a high information content altogether about the waves that, that we receive with whichever, whichever instruments. Now, I'm going to focus as a seismologist primarily on seismic waves, but I think um, some of these concepts can be generalized to other systems as well. Now, why are seismic waves quite interesting? Um, it's because they, they are uh, vectorial waves and they, they sort of um, take on different types of, of wave propagation within solid media. So we have compressional deformation, we have shear deformation, we have waves that propagate solely along surfaces, other waves that, that basically traverse the, the body of a medium. And as such, they, they carry very distinct information about different parts of either the source where they come from or the past. Um, in terms of sort of environmental sensing, they're independent of wind and noise to a large extent, and vegetation and topography, which, which is a, a problem in environmental sensing when you look at satellites and acoustic sensors, for example. So um, I hope I made the case well that, that waves are incredibly efficient at carrying information. Now the question is, why do we worry about waves? Why, why do we want them? So um, this is a, a snapshot of a seismic wave field propagating through the interior of the planet. And what you see on the left is a, a, a point source, which could be an earthquake. And the triangle here is a, is a receiver where you absorb the waves or observe the waves by means of these time series. Now, why do we worry about them? I, I would imagine quite a few of you um, are within miles of the San Andreas Fault right now, um, or work there at least. And as such, I think you should be um, concerned about shaking. That's just one example, of course. There are many other examples why waves are interesting not the least through noise cancellation and whatever else. So in, in the case of uh, what we call seismic hazard assessment, this is the following problem. You have an earthquake fault, such as in San Andreas or any other one, um, which would then be 
be equivalent source here on the left hand side. And you have some sort of infrastructure or other um, worthy environment that you want to protect from damage. That could be people, that could be infrastructure, or buildings. And as such, you want to characterize how strong shaking happens. And for that, you need to characterize what the wave does along its path. So that is a truly three dimensional problem. Um, the good news is that um, for many cases, at least in seismology, we can, we can uh, rely on a linear wave system. So that works for small deformations, and it's a fairly good approximation for almost everything that we look at, except for the very, very um, sort of vicinity of, of the earthquake itself. So um, that is nice. That makes it uh, makes life seemingly a bit simpler than, let's say, in sort of nonlinear fluid dynamics. But I'll, I'll get to um, some other complexities that we face in a moment. Now, here's the actual problem. If you want to solve real-world problems, hello? Uh, when you say linear, it looks like you don't actually mean linear functions. You actually mean a propagation that's mostly a, a thin wave front. Is that right? No, sorry. You know, what, what I mean with linear, I'll get to that in a moment, is a linear oh. partial differential equation. Yeah, yeah, it's, it. yeah it's, it's an equation that, that um, you know, where the input um, is, is a linear function of the output, essentially. Okay, so if you, if you double the, the amplitude of the source, um, you double the amplitude of the um, um, shaking, for example. So that is that is a really um, fundamental and simple uh, system in the sense that you can apply linear filter theory and, and sort of operators like that. So um, it's it's just a means of, of characterizing these kinds of partial differential equations with simple Laplacian terms and, and time derivatives. Um, right, so I'll, I'll get to that in a moment, actually. Mm -hmm. But um, the real crux in this um, problem while being linear is not the complexity of the mathematical expressions, it's the size of the problem if you scale it up to real world problems. And that, of course, goes back to why, you know, waves are interesting is because they propagate over huge distances. So we can observe um, basically small scale perturbances in, in, in the interior of the planet um, over the entire planet. And that means we need to discretize the entire planet in four dimensions. So that is three, four space and one for time. And that easily leads up to problems of the size of 10 to the 15 degrees of freedom. So simply because we, we need to characterize small scale perturbations propagating in a 3D domain over some time. Um, it's, it's basically dependence on the fourth power of the frequency of the wave. Now, um, that's not everything. That's just for one simulation. That is, if you have one source, you insert it somewhere on the planet and you want to observe the wave everywhere else. Now, there are costs beyond that, so to speak. And those are when you want to solve actual real world problems. Now, when you solve one um, equation, one, one uh, forward map, so to speak, and that's, that could be 10 to the 15 degrees of freedom. Now, the problem is when you, when, you, when you actually solve an actual scientific problem, such as seismic hazard assessment, or you do inference, you need to do this for many, many realizations of this, of this uh, parameter set. So there is, you need to move the um, seismic sources around to characterize the whole region. You need to maybe update the parameters, such as the 3D wave speeds of the so elastic parameters of the medium. And that could easily lead to 1 million different realizations of this forward map. Um, so that is the overall simulation problem. Now, um, beyond that, we have the, I guess, what we call inference problem. So how do we compute posteriors? I imagine most people are familiar with this. Um, for 10 to the 6 parameters, so those are the, the elastic parameters inside the interior of the planet, where Bayesian inference typically fails for 100. Maybe within your expertise, you can push this much further. But I would be very surprised if you can push it to 10 to the 6 parameters with a full MCMC. So you know, beyond that, there is uncertainties. We need to select data. We need to worry about noise. Um, how do we downscale any inference problem? How do we verify and interpret it? All of these are basically unresolved problems um, at face value. So of course we have different ideas on how to deal with some of this, but essentially this is the overall problem and it's nowhere near solving it. Now, um, what I'm sort of more and more interested in in, in recent years is, is how do we how do we um, observe our Earth system in a better way, and that is understand these sort of interconnected complex systems, maybe detect potential tipping points in climate and biodiversity crises with such sparse and noisy and heterogeneous data. So that is sort of apply the inference problem to these very, very complex data points. I'll get back to that at the very end of the talk. And I hope you, you find that um, equally linked and exciting to, to the simulation problem. Now, this might be daunting, but of course it opens opportunities. Now, what I'm gonna sort of keep as the red threat for this talk is how we can adapt solutions. That is, we, we keep them accurate. We want to solve an accurate problem 
um, an accurate solution to an actual problem, um, but we want to adapt them in some ways to the complexity of the problem. Now, what I want to get at first is um, here's sort of the you know NASA image of, of the sliver of life, so to speak, on the top of the uh, planet, and um, of course, what we do with the waves, we kind of penetrate the entire interior of that. So we sample a huge amount of space, and we want to use that to infer on what we either understand about the source of the um, emanating wave or the path effects. Now, what does it depend on? I think mainly sort of three categories. It's the data, the processes that we deal with, and the scales. Um, so what, what do we do about data? So we need to worry about how much data we have, the quality of, of each individual data point, and the resolution in sort of spatial scales and homogeneity in terms of coverage. So these are all very, very pronounced and, and ubiquitous problems in seismology. What about scale? So in, in many cases, um, they're limited, of course. It's not completely wide spectra, multi-scale. Um, there also might be gaps. So sometimes you have very good resolution at a small scale and at a larger scale, but nothing in between. And there is some sort of connectivity between space time. So typically small, um, small scales are more important for the shorter time scales and, and the same for or the opposite for a larger time scale. And then largely, as I said, the processes themselves, they could be linear, non-linear, or even stochastic. So as I said, I'm going to focus on the processes of wave propagation as a linear problem. But that is not to say that the world as such is linear, much the opposite. In, 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 yeah, much, much like the opposite, I would, I would rather uh, focus on, the, on this idea of complexity. And I think we're not really um, attuned to this, to this as much as we should be, especially in, in terms of our emerging environmental crisis. So I think, I think the sort of issue of complexity is something that I want to, um, want to um, argue most of this uh, with. But, but um, not only that, we face each other with a complex system of interconnected complex systems and trying to observe that. We could observe that with linear systems such as wave propagation, but in the end, what we want to infer are these very interconnected complex systems. So I think um, we might not be able to, to, to model all of this, but we could try to use um, simpler physical processes such as wave propagation to, to get the most of or about these sort of complex systems and then understand some of their behaviors from that. So in doing so, of course, we need to go back to this uh, cost problem. And with that, I mean, how do we how do we find in the system, it could be wave propagation for the whole planet or even in the atmosphere or anywhere else, how can we find some sort of way to down-dimensionalize the problem from 10 to the 15 degrees of freedom and even more to something smoother or smaller? So that's, of course, connected to all these, these ideas of sparsity or smoothness or facility, dimensionality reduction, all sort of the same thing. And the question is, can we find them and can we then utilize them in defining simulation? So um, simulation is one thing. I guess one can see that as a um, sort of the forward map. You you give a assumed number of parameters uh, about the system, and you you compute that through a mathematical process, like a partial differential equation. Now, um, that's in my sort of worldview what nature does. Nature is essentially a forward problem, and the question is, we're not nature. We want to learn about nature, so we need to think about how we go about this. And that, I think, is useful in the categorization of sort of forward and inverse problems. So in the, in the um, uh, forward problem, one could say, let there be a big one, like uh, earthquake on the San Andreas, and a uh, assumed wave equation, linear wave equation. What do you want to know? Where should you not stand? So that is a unique problem because it maps a, a well-defined set of forward uh, parameters into, uh, through the mathematical equation into, into a unique solution. So in other words, this could be seen as what nature does. Um, it's kind of causality, it's objectivity, if you will, given the uh, sort of accuracy of these parameters. Now, um, contrasting that, we could, we could define inverse problems as the following. So we could say, let there be just some wiggle to be observed, for example, some shaking uh, beneath the house. The question is, where does this wave come from and what has it sensed along its path? So it's basically inferring on the parameters on what happened along the path, inferring on the sort of three-dimensional structure of the planet, for example, we call that tomography. And I think importantly, this is, this is where we come in. This is where we choose the data, where we choose a way to build an inference framework. And as such, it's much more driven by subjective choices. And I think, I think this is important to keep in mind, and I'm just I'm showing this by, by means of an arts example. So here's a, a, some sort of a fresco from Spain somewhere with um, um, heterogeneous data coverage. And you put that into some cooking engine, and then out comes the, the so solution, which is a perfect solution to the input data. 
but you could imagine maybe not the, the ideal. So this is this is this inverse problem. Now I'm not going to talk too much about inverse problems or inference. Um, it looms sort of beyond, but I think it's very important to always keep that in mind. And unlike the forward map, uh, which we define as linear in this wave equation system, the inverse map is inherently non-linear. Non -linear. It's also, of course, non-unique. It's opposed, non-verifiable in seismology, at least subjective and, and even more expensive. So it's it's certainly a um, next level problem. So let me go to the heart of the problem. What do we want to do? We want to produce synthetic um, seismograms of this kind to fit in be able to, to sort of work with waves um, in the seismological context. So it's kind of like getting to the heart as EKG, EK, EKGs, for example, in this context. It's producing the wiggles through a uh, machinery that we want to define. Now, what is the wave equation? This is, again, back to the um, um, question Greg asked about the linearity. So here, here is sort of the elastodynamic um, equation of motion, which in simple terms is a kinetic term um, for a displacement field U. So that's a vectorial problem. And it's the acceleration of it with the density. There's a stress divergence. And the stress is then subjected to a rheological relationship. So it relates to the strain or to the deformation. So within that, we will have a dependence on the displacement vector u. And in the simplest case, this becomes a linear stress-strain relationship. And then this becomes a second derivative on the, on, the, on the spatial scales. So in other words, this becomes a wave equation that um, basically has two dominant terms. That's on the one hand, the second time derivative that equals three factors plus constant terms of the second space derivatives, or Laplacian. So that is a classical uh, way of a wave equation. So the sources, turn to F, they could be earthquake rupture, it could be environmental noise, or some sort of crater impact, for example. Um, the stress divergence, it embeds basically the material information. So it embeds the parameters of the system, such as elastic or the seismic wave speeds, porous media, um, non-linear behavior, all of that sort of stuff. Um, it could also embed other uh, so more complex interactions, such as the solid fluid boundary conditions, interactions between, let's say, ocean waves, such as tsunamis and, and uh, earthquake waves and so on. But um, I'll neglect that for now. And then if you want to further complexify our lives, you could add sort of linear terms here. This could be, for example, gravity, so the sort of breathing modes of the Earth, Earth rotation, large deformations, advective processes. So all of these things can can sort of add to the wave equation and then become much more complicated. But neglecting all this, I want to sort of um, show you one, one way of uh, solving this in, in seismological context, which has been quite popular in the last 20 years. And that's what we call the spectral element method. It's a high order finite element method, and it simply uses conventional finite element theory basically to turn the sort of second order wave system into a um, uh, system of ordinary differential equations um, of first order. Um, so that then becomes a global system of these ordinary differential equations in time, and that you can then step forward in an explicit manner. This is if your so called mass matrix, I'm talking to those now who, who are familiar with these problems, I guess. If your mass matrix is diagonal, and in, the, in these sort of um, discretizations and choices of basis functions, the math matrix is diagonal by construction. So happy to talk about more and more details or send papers, but this is this is a very convenient way of solving these problems, and and it allows us to scale that extremely efficiently to large scale supercomputing. So yeah, is question? this uh, an approximation that had that gives us some accuracy, or is this one of those where you say every time step is a linear solve? But the linear problem keeps changing over time to make sure that you actually are solving the nonlinear problem. No, this is this is really. Um, I mean, this is a general strategy of solving uh, differential equations. But applied to this linear system, which is the one we have on the page here, um, it 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 just ensures that it's an explicit solution in time, which means you can separate sort of the spatial discretization from the time discretization. So that is sort of one of the main effects of this explicit solution. But it, it, it says nothing directly about the accuracy. I mean, this is still a continuous formulation here. It's just a weak formulation of the equations of motion. And, and this weak formulation is, is, is not yet discretized. So it doesn't say much about the accuracy. This, it's perfectly continuous in, the, in functional space in this case. OK, so this so, is not a solution to the original equation, just chopped up into a certain, you know, to have some certain linearities, right. not an approx it's, it's, a linear approximation of the original equation. So um, let me go back. This is already a linear equation. So if ah, okay. you want to take this as a an approximation, it is because inside this stress divergence, we have um, then assumed a linear stress-strain relationship, which is valid for small deformations. 
So if you assume okay. that, then this, 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 this system is by construction linear. Of course, it's an assumption that doesn't work for very, very large scale deformations, such as in the very vicinity of an earthquake, for example, where you have huge deformations, or where you have nonlinear effects such as liquefaction, when, when you really disturb the entire uh, system in a nonlinear way. But if you assume this, what we call the strong form uh, of the system, it is linear by construction. And this is just giving it the integral of the weak form um, in a continuous way, the same way. So it's, the, it's, the, it's sort of the integral equivalent of the previous um, strong form. Thank you. Yeah. OK, so, so if, if we um, take this weak form, so that's, that's really an analytical um, transformation, we can, then, we can then discretize it and then solve it by, by means of, um, of various toolboxes um, in an explicit manner with um, higher time stepping or whatever. The, the, the good news is that it, it scales extremely well on, on, on um, parallel computing infrastructures. And that is because you can, you can sort of use you know, finite element um, uh, domain decomposition very easily and the scalability is excellent. So it, it ranks amongst the best scalable PDEs or, or PD solutions, um, I should say, on supercomputing. It, it won the Gordon Bell Prize in tw 20 years ago, I think. Um, so, so it scales really well, but of course it, it, it has to if we want to solve these large scale problems um, that I alluded to beforehand. Now, these solutions to the 3D problem have existed for 20 years, but they still struggle to this day to get, get to the highest um, desired solutions, highest sorry, highest desired um, resolutions. So that if you still want to discretize the very small scales that we might be interested in, then um, these, these full 3D solutions are still very, very expensive. So this brings me back to this concept of data parsimony, which is um, the idea that um, your, your data, your observations, they don't necessarily um, need the full complexity of the 3D space that, that they propagate through. So in other words, there could be sections of the planet which, which you know, have some sort of smooth variation in, its, in, in the properties, or there could be a you know, dimension within the system that is smoother than another one. I'll get back to that in slightly more detail, but what I want to um, focus on here is, is basically um, a figure that you see that is a collection of 400,000 um, stacked seismograms, so that is stacked data, um, aligned across the surface of the planet. So there's zero, di zero distance from an earthquake and 180 degrees, which is the antipode. So it's the opposite end of the planet. And the vertical axis is time. So this is really a seismogram sort of lined upward. And these are 480,000 contributing stacked seismograms. And if um, we would um, assume that the planet is fully complex, that is, that if the waves sort of bounce around and transmit and, and refract in all possible directions in 3D, we would expect a much more scattered plot than this one. What we see here are these very crisp lines, and they allude to um, very basic reflections in spherical layers of the Earth. So basically, we have the surface, we have the core metal boundary, and a few layers like that in between. And there, there are spherical shells, and they completely dominate the seismic data. So, so these lines, um, they, they would be, if, if the Earth was spher spherically symmetric, that is only composed of these shells, and these, these would be the only data, there would be crisp lines. And what we see in this, in this huge stacked plot is that, by and large, the actual data obeys you know, to 90 degrees or so, to these sort of spherically symmetric um, base models. So, of course, that's not enough because we are interested in the variations in 3D. We are interested in where it deviates from that, and where sort of you know stacking um, kind of kind of cancels some of these some of these uh, variations. But um, it is a property of our planet and basically of compaction and gravitation that these spherical shells are the dominant features in the wave field or from which the wave field absorbs basically propagation properties. So the question has always been, can we somehow harness, can we exploit the sparsity in space? In other words, that we have a dominant radial structure that produces most of the, uh, most of the data um, interactions um, with the medium, um, and, and then sort of work on the deviations from that in a different context. So um, what it sort of refers to is, I guess, quotes like this one, where it says, we shouldn't overdo the complexity of our solutions in the numerical context, for example, and in, in computational cost, if the data don't need it. So um, this goes back to, I guess, concepts of rock conservator, and I'm happy as um, you know, a, a um, 
employer of Oxford University to quote this paper from 1321, published here. Um, um, and, and that is essentially the idea that, that of course, one, one um, should stick to the simplest, most solution that gives you the, the correct solution in some paraphrased way. So this was something I've done years ago, uh, 15, 20 years ago. And that is an axisymmetric solution to the global wave propagation problem, where you basically say the predominant layers of the Earth are really the predominant part of the wave field. So can we find a cheaper solution to full 3D wave propagation, but only looking at these, these um, spherical layers for the Earth? So it's a full 3D solution, but it comes at the cost of a 2D numerical domain. That is because we can characterize the, the, the um, input source uh, radiation analytically and for the third dimension, for the azimuthal direction. So we can then basically um, devise a mathematical solution um, numerically with, with axisymmetry that basically evaluates this third dimension analytically and we can discretize space on the two dimension. So this allows us to then propagate waves um, at very high frequency in, in this um, um, three dimensional medium. Here you see pretty much a cross cut of that, but only for these axisymmetric media. So that is quite useful because, it, like I said, it, it simulates 90% of, of the seismic data. And you, you can do inference problems starting from that 90% of the correct, correctly simulated data. That's, of course, nice and it's great. But what we then um, sort of geared up for was, can we go further? Can we sort of exploit the fact that um, the Earth is predominantly um, you know, spherically layered, but only with small deviations in, in, the, three, in the third dimension, in the sort of azimuthal dimension. What we did here is we took one of the three-dimensional modeling tools called SPECFEM um, that existed, and, and we, we just took a snapshot of the seismic wave field of the solution essentially in two different, um, two different uh, orientations. So one is there's a source here. It's the in-plane propagation, sort of outwards from, from the source. Um, from the North Pole and it propagates downwards. And you see a lot of complexity in the wave field that is simply due to what I said, um, interactions with various layers at depth, just the sort of spherical layers. And and I should say this is for 1D. So this is really for the spherically symmetric uh, layer model. And if you then take an equatorial cut, so a cut along the azimuth, um, like this, you see exact symmetry. So this, this, this is the axis symmetry of the one-dimensional Earth model. So that, that of course, just sort of says what, what we assumed in the previous uh, axisymmetric modeling engine. But the question, of course, is when you go to a realistic 3D Earth model, what happens next? So what happens next is essentially the following. So you see that um, if I go from here to here, you will see the, the change over in the slides as being the change in the three-dimensional, uh, one-dimensional to three-dimensional Earth model. So it's, it's a small change in the, in the um, three-dimensional wave field. Um, but the, the big news is that the that the um, symmetry in the azimuthal plane, as you see here, um, breaks down. But it doesn't break down in a very complex manner. It breaks down only to lead to a very smooth rendition of that of that azimuth. So it's much smoother along this dimension than it is in the in-plane direction, so outward going ways. Now that is a, is a really crucial realization because it says, well, if we then discretize this outgoing solution in a different way than in the azimuthal direction, we can possibly shortcut huge amounts of computational power. So in other words, three-dimensional solutions that don't take advantage of this, they totally oversample this third dimension because they would discretize this much, much finer level than what we have to do basically to obey the full um, solution. So in other words, what we then um, um, realize is that you, you can, capture most of the wave field complexity in the 1D structures, like I said earlier, and that 3D wave fields retain only very little um, imprint from, from the azimuthal uh, three-dimensional structure. Um, and this is this is really crucial if we want to exploit that numerically. So what we then did was we, we stick to a, a spectral element type of discretization in its outgoing direction, but then solve a pseudo-spectral expansion with Fourier expansions in the third dimension. So with that expansion, we can then um, tweak or, or sort of locally um, locally optimize the, the Fourier expansion coefficients to which we want to go in the third dimension. And that leads, leads us to a drastic shortcut in computational cost. So what you see here is basically sort of a sketched version of this and how we how we do this mathematically. So it's basically the solution ansatz for the three-dimensional wave system in spherical coordinates. So you have R, radial direction, and theta. Those are the in-plane directions, sort of the, this two-dimensional slice. And phi is the azimuthal third dimension. And what, what this um, ansatz does is basically it couples um, through alpha, the, the Fourier coefficient, 
um, basically the in-plane solution, which is the, the spectral element solution here, with the Fourier expansion over here in the in the um, exponential. So, so what that does, it allows us by by tweaking n locally, depending on each point in the two D domain, um, to 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 the complexity in the wave field. So, if the wave field um, basically takes up high complexity in the third dimension, we go to very high Fourier expansion. If it seems to be very smooth, which is actually the case for large parts of the Earth, we can stick to lower resolution. So we've done that with a PhD student, uh, Kun Dai Leng, um, in the group, and he he wrote the solver, which is on GitHub, and it it allowed us to simulate these very complex wave fields. So this is a um, 1D Earth model. On top of that, a three-dimensional crustal model, then a three-dimensional tomographic model of the Earth, and we added some random scatterers of the crust of the Earth. So that is is a simulation that we can do on fairly moderate uh, computational infrastructures. If you did that in in sort of um, you know complexly agnostic 3D solvers, this would be a gigantic simulation with hundreds of thousands of CPUs. So what you see here is is this incredible wealth that the wave field sort of produces in terms of shaking across the continent. So here's a simulation for earthquake in Virginia, and what you see all in in sort of bright colors here are full 3D effects where waves bounce up and down in the sort of slope of the crustal interface between the continent and the oceans. And these are effects that you wouldn't easily see in data because you only look at one point when you look at seismic data usually. So these are really interesting types of solutions to this problem. Another um, sort of um, uh, holy grail of seismology, if you will, is, is um, going to the highest possible frequencies in the globe. And this is typically seen as one hertz. So if you can simulate across the globe one hertz, you, you sort of solve the propagation problem. And so with this method, because we can we can work on these shortcuts, we've done that. And in the application of um, some very small scale structures, um, which we call ultra low velocity zones, and they're sort of five kilometer scale uh, structures at the top of the uh, Earth's core mental boundary. And what you see here is what kind of um, complex wave fields they produce just by having an impinging wave that interacts with the boundaries. And this is sort of the first solution at one hertz for a globe. And it, it is doable with this technique. Um, as you see in the bottom, I hope you can read it. Um, it took us 44,000 um, CPU hours, um, of course, in parallel. If you were to do this with a classical three-dimensional numerical solver, you would need 40 million CPU hours. So that is what that azimuthal cost setting gives us, and it gives us the exact solution. So it's really worthwhile thinking about these sort of physical properties of the wave field to then design the solution after it. Here's another um, um, example. This is um, an area that you should be familiar with. It's the Bay Area and the Hayward Fault. And we've simulated here um, just a potential earthquake on the Hayward Fault. And this is the sort of emanating fault rupture. And this is the corresponding earthquake um, uh, shaking. So again, there's very strong 3D effects due to the sedimentary basins and so on, and they're really crucial to, to inform building codes and shaking maps for this region. So this is another assessment where you need fairly high frequencies um, in the 3D wave field, and again, it's modeled with the same software. Now, um, this, this is great, so we've, yeah. Let me ask about this one. Um, my understanding of the, the approach is, because I'm seeing I mean, there's a depth dimension, I mean, you're leveraging symmetry, and one, surface dimension is how I can think about it. And clearly I'm seeing two surface dimensions. So the way I understand the technique to work is effectively you take a bunch of these two dimensional spherical models and you just kind of offset them at a certain, you know, every four year term is one more of these spherical models somewhat offset, right? Yeah. And I'm having trouble visualizing a four year series going like, I imagine there's this one model going north to south and a four year term is going left to right kind of intuition is what I have. Is that about right? Maybe not quite. So, so think of this as a sort of slice um, through north and south pole center of the Earth and then yeah. let's say latitude or longitude zero, Greenwich. Mm -hmm. Take that 2D slice and then, and then rotate that by let's say every right. 10 degrees. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then you have sort of these you know, 36 slices or, or 18 yes. slices around the Earth. The, the, the crucial bit is that, that these are then linked, they're directly coupled through the Fourier coefficients. Right. But that's so, really so that is, like this. These these are tiny, I mean, they're, you know, these are 10 degrees. These are much tinier than 10 degrees. And yeah, so here the, 
the whole simulation here is locally. So so we've done the whole sort of cylindrical decomposition just on the local local. Um, ah, so should I be thinking like a point one degree, point one degree, but that's not very wide. Yeah. So so in this case, um, the whole domain is what you see. So the whole numerical domain is is, is what you see. It's just a bit area. So it's and, more and the, within. Uh, out. Sorry. The, the, these the there are far fewer of these spherical slices, but they're all packaged into this area. Yeah. So so, I mean, I think what's what's crucial is is to note that the um, the um, Fourier coefficient, the maximal Fourier coefficient, is the crucial parameter of the cost in this sense. Mm -hmm. And the more you can reduce that in in some places, the the cheaper your simulation. So we basically sort of run these trial runs at, at low resolution which then inform how how we can how we can define this map of wave field complexity and that allows us then to to um, decide where we need to sort of go to high Fourier um, expansion and where we can stick to lower Fourier expansion and that is informed by let's let's say these, these sort of trial solutions but also to the proximity of the central axis and and with this uh, in, information we can we can then tune basically fine-tune this the sort of layering in the azimuth direction so it's it's in, in in reality it's not really consecutive slices in in, in this azimuth it's for each for each element in the two-dimensional um slice sort of the base slice it's a different different uh, Fourier expansion so for each element in this 2d slice you basically have a different different sort of spacing along the azimuth direction and that okay. gives us the real the real benefit so what can you not do this way at, at what point does it get too hard too hard that you need too many Fourier components if if the um so if you have a fully um let's say uh, a three-dimensional um parameter set of of elastic properties that has no preferential direction that is if you have no compaction with depth for example where the um, sort of complexity of wave interactions is as strong in the horizontal direction as it is in the vertical direction, then mm -hmm. the, the the sort of energy that would propagate along the azimuth would probably be as dominant as the energy that propagates in the in-plane direction. But but if you think of, of, of a point source and the, the sort of wave fronts that emanate outwards, they will always have this outward sort of trajectory as a dominant, as a dominant sort of trajectory, right? And as such, there's always sort of an intrinsic tendency that that the outgoing wave front is is the dominant one in terms of complexifying the wave field due to these interactions. Um, having said that, if you have very strong energy reflections along the azimuth, so that could be if there is let's say a salt body or something like that, um, and the, the wave it, wave field hits that and then reflects, then you need to discretize that at a very high resolution. And in that case, if you then um, need to discretize the Fourier coefficients at the same sort of spatial scale as the in-plane direction, then overhead of going to Fourier space and back to physical space um, becomes becomes the bottleneck. So that then that's not worthwhile doing this sort of decomposition. Okay, so we've question, not we've no. not found any example where this is actually the case. So we've tried this from sort of exploration scale, very small scale modeling to global scale to on Mars to on Moon and then Sun, and and all of this always had some sort of parsimony okay, okay so i'm thinking now you have a, a surface crust and waves most of our brigade on the outward side and less so in the depth side right or maybe the, 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 the right uh and if it's uh water it should propagate in all dimensions especially water in a pool where you have boundaries yeah. in both directions so you can't yes. choose one but if you have boundaries in one direction, you can cheat in that in that side. You can get yeah. special in that. But if it's free in the other, like a tube, you can still get away with it. Yeah, it's a very good example. So I think anything where, where sort of energy comes back in, like like a, a, a swimming pool, like you said, that that is something where it just becomes not advantageous. You could still do it, but it doesn't become advantageous. The other the other limitation of this method is that you kind of need to obey the same wave equation in the azimuth because it's a Fourier expansion, at least the way we have it formalized now. There are many more ways of, of extending that with you know other bases, wavelets, um, with machine learning and so on. We, we just haven't done it. But um, but in the current formulation in the Fourier domain, you kind of need to have basically either an acoustic wave or, or an elastic wave system in the in the azimuth direction. So that is, is a current limitation. So we can't do sort of ocean topography across the azimuth at this stage. And then yeah. the reflections from, from a pool, yeah, I agree. And you just mentioned uh, machine learning. I mean, to me, 
for your series, just one one of these uh, ML algorithms. So if you were to replace it with a, I don't know, any other way of weighting your your spherical sphere, well, your, your two dimensional mm -hmm. spheres, what what would change? You would, I think, I think the the limitation of the Fourier basis is just that it's it's a it's a global expansion. So it kind of assumes that what, whatever happens along the entire circle of the azimuth is is sort of the same. But often what happens is that that you have you know just one structure in one location. So you might want to densify your resolution there, but then you could stay closer. So short term Fourier transformers so or some sort of machine learning equivalent to that would be absolutely um, interesting, I would say. Okay, but like wavelets can be local or whatever. Neural nets can yeah, be exactly. just so a local basis could be definitely be interesting. Yeah. Okay, makes sense. Yeah. What what also we we um sort of have done talk is how how we do the um, information to, for the wave it's basically discretization of the wave complexity, which we need to to decrease the Fourier coefficients. So that that is informed by trial solutions. I think that, that there, there could be sort of smarter algorithms to do that. How you know previous previous simulations can be can inform future simulations and that sort of thing. Um, it. That, that just takes another level of, of linking these different data sets. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thanks for these questions. OK, so so I'm going to go back to the overall complexity um, of the cost and the, the speed up that we can. So essentially, like I said, the, 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 the cost of these types of simulations scales directly with the simulation period and the fourth power. So if you if you follow the, the blue line here, that's a SPEF, which is a, a conventional sort of three-dimensional solver, a very good one, but it's 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 full 3D differentiation. And and then what you see here is a is a, is a um, logarithmic cost for CPU hours in the vertical axis, and the simulation period is basically the, the cost function. So so if you go to small periods, you, you get to the really really expensive simulations, small scale basically. Um, now, what you see are basically then three different curves here for, for our code called Axon 3D. And, and the full 3D one, and, 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 and full 3D meaning this is a full 3D model with all the complexities involved, um, then has a smaller speed up, but it still is massively cheaper, orders of magnitude cheaper at the, at the small resolutions and at the high cost basically than the full 3D solution. So we, we, we simulate up to three, four orders of magnitude faster at the sort of one hertz goal here. If we if we go you know to, to these to these sort of uh, coupled hybrid methods, now is that everything? Um, well, it it sort of saves us a lot. It saves us a lot of computation time, and the question is, have we solved it all? Um, and I guess this is where I'm moving on to the next stage, and that is machine learning and simulation. So we haven't really full, solved it all because um, you know and I mentioned already these sort of next level costs, like um, doing this a million times or or um, you know doing, doing Bayesian inference with that. So we're still we're still faced with an absolutely fundamentally massive scale computational problem. So here are just some some sort of strategies and ideas how machine learning can be used for these pricey PDE solutions. Um, so one is just you know use machine learning. With machine learning, I mean some sort of agnostic um, you know kind of black box almost where we we don't locally discretize with a known mathematical map um, how we how we propagate the system. We just sort of try to learn from the data. That's what I mean with machine learning here. Um, so forward order inverse problems can be just fully or partly replaced. But um, there are other things that are just equally important. There's how can we accommodate multi-scale structures, multi-scale physics, for example. So if you incorporate tsunamis or porous media or gravity or whatever, um, you, you can think about dimensionality reduction in these sort of hybrid uh, connected systems. And then, and then I think another huge problem is to reduce the overall problem size. So with that I mean, we don't have to just do one simulation. The, the overall problem size is doing that a million times. So can we somehow inform these different forward maps, you know, from each other and to each other? So um, here's some sort of, uh, sort of the end member um, approaches to PD solutions. One is the purely physics-driven traditional simulation approach, which is what I've shown so far on the right side. And then on the left side is kind of the purely data-driven stuff, um, I guess, deep learning and so on. So um, yeah, so so what you see here is Axis seven. That's our, our previous solution, and I would sort of put the Axis three D, which is the one that is sort of um, um, using wave field complexity in a slightly shifted um, um, way because it's sort of driven by the data from from previous simulations. So it's, it's a bit more data driven than the pure traditional simulation. Um, but then if you go further to the left or sort of start completely on the left, you're basically in the context of of replacing PDEs completely with with uh, um, with machine learning um, 
um, framework, and and we've done that with uh, WaveNet actually, Google's WaveNet um, or DeepMind's, I guess, um, in 2018. I'll, I'll show that in a moment um, for for very simple 1D structures, and that worked really well. Um, and that is really just taking sample simulations by finite differences, and then using these results um, to train a WaveNet model, and then produce these sort of seismic waveforms with it. And then, and then we've done that in 2D for sort of fault inter intersecting structures. I'll show that next. And then I think what I'll focus on a bit more in this talk um, today is the physics informed neural network. So right in the middle, it's kind of really using physics knowledge and, and then still training our neural network. OK, so, so um, sorry, I might have skipped over a slide here, but that's OK. I'll just focus on the pin. So what we do here is basically um, um, to the, sort of add physics um, information to the, to the loss. And, and that that we do by by just constraining basically the um, the um, training with with the wave equation itself. So in this case, it's the acoustic wave equation, two dimensions, and we we train it on boundary conditions and so on as well. But in long story short, what it does is basically um, accommodate some of these more complex wave interactions in very very complex two D structures, such as this model here. So the, with model, I mean the structures, the elastic structures, and and what you see at the bottom. Um, in the interest of time, is the ground truth simulation with FD, where the wave field propagates outwards in different time snapshots, and the prediction with the neural network, this uh, physics informed neural network, with the physics loss um, that, that simulates the sort of bulk, bulk properties of the wave field very accurately. It does struggle quite a bit with these sort of later um, um, reflective phases. And that is essentially because I think it just doesn't know enough about the complexity of these wave interactions. So that's where either more training would be needed or more 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 um, more information for the physics. Now, I want to briefly mention um, that, that pins are not the end of the story, I think, and they, they are not necessarily much much faster because you need to train them on a given input parameter set. But I think I think they provide a really interesting framework to combine knowledge from our you know sort of numerical and physical um, experience with with how we can train uh, networks and we've sort of pushed it a, this a bit further in recent years and one is is the um problem that pins face in terms of scaling up to multi-scale or large scale problems so so pins do quite well on sort of um more monochromatic problems where you you just sort of map a, a system with a physical equation to a different location for example in space and time um, but but when it really needs to go through multi-scale um, um, properties, it, it really struggles to to um, to extrapolate that. So um, what we then came up with is sort of borrowing ideas from finite element theory and the spectral elements, for example, by doing basically the simple idea of domain decomposition and sub and then some other features like subdomain normalization and training schedules. And what it does in effect is basically just subdivide space into into sub networks, and then does sort of like like in finite element um, simulations, does the the addition of the boundary contributions to the overall solution um, um, after after sort of simulating each each local um, solution. So we call that the finite basis pins, and that works fairly well. So here's just one example. Um, it's an archive paper last year, actually the year before I think, and it'll be soon a um, ACM paper I think. Um, and what you see here is is a very simple 1D um, problem um, of, for for a uh, first order differential equation, and what you see is that the pin solution just doesn't converge to the exact solution in gray, whereas the FB pin solution does, and that is because it's a very large scale problem with with oscillatory uh, behavior all along, and the, and the pin just doesn't seem to get it um, even even with with a huge amount of training. Thank so you. so I yeah. Color a different neural net. Uh, yes, yes. In this case, yeah, I think. So, yeah. is the domain decomposition like I should have like really find an element in space? Each spatial region is a fine, is a new different neural net, or each type of yeah. behavior, crust, mantle, core, is a different neural net. Yeah, I mean, in in our case, crust, mantle, core would be basically different spatial domains, and there would be different different neural networks. Oh, you yeah, know, the so, consistent. So, you can use space for this. Like it is behavioral decomposition. But in your case, you can use space for that behavioral decomposition. Exactly, yeah. The, the concept should be adaptable to, to any sort of concept, right? It doesn't have to be space. But in our case, it really makes sense to, to do that spatially because our multi-scale problem comes from multi-scale elastic properties, basically. 
so they're really distinct in space. So you, you want to sort of, you know, where you have small scale features like in the Earth's crust, um, you, you want to have a different neural network on that region than in about parts of the Earth's mantle, which are much smoother. Okay, so so when you, you can think, uh, adaptive metro refinement kind of stuff to say uh, the boundary of this neural net depends on local conditions, not on XYZ coordinates. Yes, um, adaptive adaptive um, mesh refinement is has been tried in seismology, but it's it's problematic for these sort of hyperbolic oscillatory solutions because very quickly you fill space with incredibly oscillatory um, 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 displacements or solutions, and that is again is basically just a function of how informative waves are. They very quickly fill space and they they sort of bounce back and forth because they propagate over such far distances. So I think it's it's unlike diffusion or vection problems where you sort of have a sort of unidir unidirectional um, propagation of information. Um, you, you could really sort of adapt your, your, your discretization much easier than in these wave problems. So I think the overhead of creating adaptive meshes is is not, from what I've seen, useful in most cases of, of wave propagation in general. Well, so I think- this sounds a little bit different from, from regular AMR. There you say, I choose different resolutions in different regions of space, time, or whatever conditions I can pull, get away with. Here mm -hmm. it's, I run different physics in different regions of the space and time, different neural nets, right? So, well, it's, it's, not, it's not really different physics. They obey the same wave equation. Um, I mean, you could do that as well. You could, you could sort of say, here's, here's an acoustic layer, here's an elastic layer. But, but it just means that the... Um, if, if you have a small region, let's say the Earth's crust, then mm -hmm. it fluctuates in its properties much more at, at a higher rate, basically, than a much larger volume beneath it. You, mm -hmm. you would basically want to discretize these neural networks accordingly. So you would want to have smaller neural networks in space, spatial dimensions inside this crust than, than in the bulk mantle, and to, to then update them um, simultaneously in a way. So, in, in in some ways, you, you sort of adapt the networks not in terms of their physical dynamics, the, the dynamics of wave propagation, but in terms of the complexity of the structures, so the multi-scale structures. I guess. When you say this smaller, for, the, for, yeah, for this particular problem, sorry. So the difference is that there the um, uh, resolution, the, the resolution of the neural net, like it's a, a convolutional neural net with like maybe a larger kernel or fine, you know, especially more refined kernel on the surface compared to the inside. It's like somewhat different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you, you sort of throw more points at it, basically, for any given spatial dimension. When you're still training, you're using the same uh, PDE, but now you Absolutely. don't have to yeah. it, The neural net, you can make a fi far more refined neural net at the surface. Exactly. Uh, and pay for that, for that training, because it's, you know, it's only for the surface. Yeah. I mean, at the surface, you you'll have to also obey boundary conditions, surface boundary conditions, and so on. But that's uh, you know, conditions so there. Okay. Yeah. So somewhat different training. So so yeah, in, in, I mean, in some parts of the domain, you'll you'll have different different specific conditions, like these boundary conditions, for example. Nice. But um, the, the overall system is is largely the same, at least in the examples that we've had. Okay. Sort of the basic PDE, uh, ODE, they're, they're all kind of the same. And then, and then if, if one of these networks is at, at the boundary, then you need to add the boundary conditions there. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. So yeah, for, for we've tried this on quite a few different equation systems. So so for, for these burgers equation and, and sort of simple ODEs, but also for the 2D wave equation, and it seems very promising. Um, there could be tweaks, you know, on how to exactly do this, but I think I think the idea of just um, divide and conquer really makes sense for these pins. So that's that's kind of the idea behind it. Okay, um, there's another level of of how we uh, we sort of want to merge all our knowledge uh, on pins, and that's um, a project where we sort of think about using this, um, you know, this sort of hybrid modeling with the with the Fourier domain, where you we we kind of categorize the in-plane direction from the azimuthal direction. And, and merge this with, with how to train neural networks. So what we've geared up to do is basically the following. So we solve the radio problem, so that is the in-plane problem, with the data-driven machine learning. And, and that is, is basically because the high frequency information is really in that, as you've seen from these snapshots, really the complex interactions of the domain um, are all in that radial direction. But it's, it's, as such, it's kind of fairly monochromatic because it's this sort of high frequency interactions. 
and and it it can be doable with with the sort of radial solution as you see here the data looks like this and the radial uh, neural network solution looks like this so we, we we just train a sort of traditional deep net in the radial coordinates and that solves basically the outgoing direction and then separately we we um solve the corrections because of the sort of you know variations in the azimuthal plane just like for this axiom 3d problem um with with a separate you know network and, and using pins in this case so we basically have a wave equation system for the for the azimuthal direction and that that is then directly merged with with the sort of radial direction so it's really merging the ideas from separating these you know wave field complexity um uh, uh maps um into into how we how we build a neural network Call it, we call that ter terrapin. It's not published yet, but it, it seems to work really well in two dimensions so far. What you see here is the ground truth wave field and the pin solution, or the terrapin solution, um, by, by sort of kick, uh, subdividing these these different neural networks as well. Um, so this is this is you know uh, basically one of the ideas of how we can speed up the problem um, using pins, and uh, I think I think that that is really still of the category of how we replace full numerical forward maps with with these sorts of you know merged physics informed neural networks. Okay, so so in summary, um, for the for the machine learning based wave propagation, what we gear up to do is, is downsize the simulation problem. So for each forward map, we want to basically define. So traditionally, we did the CNN autocoders for simple one D two D problems that had significant speed ups, and then we we looked at the pins that offer higher accuracy for the complex waves, but um, uh, problems with scaling, and then we have these sort of two more novel ideas uh, with the finite basis theory to solve multi-scale problems and Terrapin to really uh, again adapt it to the wave field complexity as we've done numerically before. So this is the still just the one simulation problem, um, um, and this is not um, everything yet, as I said beforehand. Um, now here is what we need to do in real life, that is simulate one million of these. And for a deterministic seismic hazard model. So we, we have a PhD student who's the co-author here, Fatme. She's sponsored by the New Zealand um, sort of geological survey to, to do the, exactly that. So to, to how do we simulate at high frequency for a three-dimensional earth model, one million scenario earthquakes to build a earthquake warning and tsunami map for New Zealand. And if we simulated one million of these, which is out of scale for normal, normal three-dimensional modeling, and we just had a de de deterministic uh, model, Typically, we want a probabilistic one, so you probably need around a billion. Of those. So it's it's um it's a serious challenge. Now, what we what we're trying to do now is is not to simulate a full wave equation, but think about what what do we actually want in the hazard context. And that is basically shaking uh, frequency band shaking. So what we do instead is basically think about um, can we use in the training a smart way of combining basically forward maps and then reciprocal maps. So the wave equation that's being linear obeys reciprocity. So you can basically insert, you know, at the observation point, you can sort of um, insert a source and you can record it in 3D space and where, where your earthquake happens. And, and that sort of reverse time axis and spatial axis is exactly equivalent. So in combining sort of the you know, forward and reciprocal waves and then defining data sets that are just you know, down dimensionalized because they just require a few sources, saving a lot of the data and then using that data to train neural networks. What we want to do is then have a, a sort of uh, um, map or, 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 or a system that can then generalize on, on any location of these 1 million potential earthquakes that we want to simulate. So, what we've done looks promising in the last few months. So, we, we train it again with these sort of axiom 3D simulations. And, and we look at this is the Hayward fault, by the way, again. Um, and on, on the different shaking maps, and we use these shaking maps to then to then um, map that with conventional deep networks, networks and just output uh, not the full wiggle, but just the amplitude spectra of of the of the wiggles. So that's all we need for the seismic hazard problem. So what we're doing now is basically tuning with some physics information on what we need um, these these sort of input and output parameters. But it's a much smaller set of input parameters and output parameters. And I, I do hope that that we can we can move in this direction of solving basically down dimensional sizing the amount of forward simulations that we do. Okay, so, so that's, to be that's clear, a, you have about ninety four thousand forward like the data set is just a bunch of forward runs. So it's ninety four thousand forward runs is your training set and a million. Oh no, or are those real? It, it's just ten. So the the number of simulations is just the source. So it's just ten simulations, oh. and we observe we observe them at the entire surface. So that gives us. 94,000 combined pairs of source and receiver because it's all one. It. 
And if you then do that with reciprocity, you, you can again sort of cover a huge amount of data sets um, by, by a, a small amount of simulations. Got it. So then yeah. training runs train a model that is applied a million times. Yes, exactly. And that is a huge amount of data in, in all directions, basically. So the idea is to have that incredible coverage to then train with more classical uh, deep nets on, on a sort of limited set of parameters. But that gives us exactly the right thing for the shaking. Yeah. Right, so that, that's the idea for that project. That's a PhD project running now. And then there's another PhD project that's starting, which is also exciting. It's, it's really focused on multi-scale problems. So I'm, I'm going to sort of wrap this up um, just by looking at this, but, but um, maybe important to, to listen to what I want to say. So when, when we um, gear up to simulate um, you know, a forward map, it, what we need is, is, is um, elastic properties of the planet. Um, we need to have a model of the Earth, like you know, what, what are the wave speeds and densities and so on. Well, we typically have, let's say, for Southern California or Bay Area or something or Japan, is data from many different types. So there could be some borehole data, could be topographic data, could be seismic uh, imaging from sort of exploration industries. And all of these come with very different uncertainties. They come with very different scales of resolution. And there is currently in our community not a single approach on how we effectively join these data sets and retain the information, let alone uncertainties. So what people do at this stage is just sort of throw them together and then choose the favorite part of this, um, you know, joint data set. So it's it's a bit problematic because we think um, when it comes to true shaking, we should really take the best of different data sets. And no one has really looked into this um, until recently. Uh, we've geared up with the director of the Southern California Earthquake Center on this. He has a PhD student in UC, USC. And what we're looking at is, is using um, neural processes and, and, and sort of frameworks like that to merge these different data sets, where data set means the input, input um, three-dimensional structure of the planet for a given region. And how do, we, how do we then combine this with some uncertainties and then extract the best information to then produce shaking appropriate for you know, our best knowledge of the region as a combination of these data sets is what we want to do. But I think, I think what I really want to get across now is an idea that I think is very closely linked to um, uh, JAKs and these differentiable uh, frameworks, platforms. Um, in some ways, a different way of thinking about end-to-end um, -end modeling. So conventionally, in, in my field and many other fields, we sort of produce forward modeling, and then we do some data processing, and then we do inverse modeling. They're all kind of separate processes. Of course, it doesn't make sense. In, in a sense, it's all one thing, and it's kind of full circle. So you know, to, to input a velocity model like this, you have to have solved an inverse problem beforehand. You can put it in, maybe update it. But, but what we want to do in the seismic hazard context is to say, how do we, how do we get accurate shaking um, for a given set of input models? So then, then the question is, is basically an optimization problem is to say, when we want to have accuracy at a certain frequency range for the shaking, we need to then sort of back propagate and optimize how we discretize the input model. So what we want to do is, is basically have a sort of an end-to-end -end differentiable platform that goes through the definition of these multi-scale input models through um, looking at actual data recordings, popping up the right data um, parts that we want to take out from the data, and sending that through whatever forward modeling engine we have of the ones that are presented beforehand. But the, the point being is, is that we want to actually propagate information, differentiable sort of sensitivity between the outcoming simulation of the shaking and the input model. So in some sense, optimize the output shaking with respect to what we want to define in the input model. And I think, I think these sort of platforms are, are ideal for that. And unfortunately, in academia, we don't really have the resources to fully build that, but we're sort of playing around the edges, I guess. With it. But, but this, is, this is the overall idea, is how can we actually join all of this and treat the entire problem of looking at the data, doing inference and modeling and selection of the input parameters as one problem. So I think in geophysics, I'm not aware of any, any community that does this as one problem. But I think these sort of platforms and, and the efficiency of differentiable um, physics, I guess, is, is really, really asking for it, more or less. So that's that's where we're going to with this project. Um, no, 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 if um, I can uh, interpret what you're saying. So normally, you would have a forward simulation. If you're lucky, you wrote also an adjoint for the former simulation, or you just yeah. We build a response surface, and that's the best you can get for any kind of inverse. But if you use a differentiable framework, then you get, first of all, you get the 
quasi ad join, not approximate ad join for free, but you also get an ad join with respect to your simulation parameters, discretization parameters, all these code things that have nothing to do with the physics, but you still get those approximately. So I could say, I wish I had this discretization. And yeah, exactly. That's yeah. Okay, got it. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's I mean, it, it's, it's tuned the numerical simulation to the most efficient way of doing it. So if, if I mean, we want to start with, with the science problem or societal problem, which is to say, I need to resolve shaking on a street by street basis, mm -hmm. right? Match it with Google Maps. And, and to do that, um, how do I define my input model? How do I most efficiently simulate that problem? And no, no one does this quantitatively. So, so the idea is, is to start with that um, point that we need to simulate shaking at the street level. How do we differentiate it back to defining what input physical models of the Earth we need to use, how we discretize those, which modeling engine we use, and then how we discretize the data that comes out of that. That's you know, it's not Jackson friends are good, mm -hmm. but you don't even have to do that. If you if you can run your code a bunch of times, you can use a Bayesian optimizer to start choosing your parameters for you as long as you expose that stuff. So it's there are many tools yes. available. Except that it's really expensive to to, yes. to run many. So we want to avoid running too many forward maps, basically. Got it. And but if you train a neural net, then you can run many of those as part of your exploration exactly. for yeah. yeah. So you, you, those are your options. Yeah, okay, I think I, basically I think there are many options, but what, what what needs to be done is is to flow information backwards from mm -hmm. how we're used to doing it. Yeah. Okay, I I don't have the time with me. I'm I think I'm running out, but um, oh, that's okay. Just, it's it's just really valuable. Uh, let me just check this. What, one person joined the call. For did you have a question? Uh, we cannot hear. Oh yeah. Hi, yeah, sorry I joined late. I, I don't have any questions. The reason I actually joined was uh, I'm doing a little bit of uh, work on basically neuroscience related topics. And it, it, it's actually kind of a very similar pro uh, problem in terms of um, instead of doing kind of these local approximations, looking at the entire field um, is kind of this new uh, approach to understanding like in, in doing predictions. But uh, but I joined too late to have any intelligent questions. So, so thank you. Um, no worries. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for trying. Cool. Right, cool. Then, yeah, uh, uh, Terry, Good thank you very much. It was fascinating. I mean, th th there's still a lot more that I could talk about, but, but I could. Yeah, I think we're already at uh, one fifteen. So we should, I mean, an hour and 15 oh, wow. minutes. So, but yeah, please send me your slides so I can make, make them available for everybody. Yeah, so we can... yeah I'm, I'm basically, I, I've been moving to this one, which is more of a fun. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> so awesome. it's, it's all about elephants uh, and, and complexity in environmental data. <laughs> yeah, I actually do want to see those slides. Yeah, but yeah, thank you very much. Uh, this was great.